WBSM presents The Ken Pittman Show. Streaming live on WBSM.com and the WBSM app. Call 508-996-0500. Now, Ken Pittman. And back in for the final hour, Tim Weisberg filling in for Ken Pittman this morning, 508-996-0500. You can also use App Chat on the WBSM app if you would like to do that. I'm going to remind you to, again, if you don't listen during the week, if you don't hear me, you can usually catch me weekday morning, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. I also do the Spooky South Coast program on Saturday nights, but we are on hiatus for that right now. Um, eventually... We'll come back to it, but I'm still kind of getting back to the point. For those unaware, I had um, I had kidney cancer, and I had to have one of my kidneys removed back in January. So late January, I had I went in, had surgery, had the kidney removed, spent a couple of weeks at home recovering, came back to work. I'm pretty much back to everything that I was doing before, but I still get pretty tired at night, and I usually zonk out like around nine o'clock. So I, I haven't had the energy level to be able to come in and do spooky South Coast. But eventually we'll come back to it. Um, certainly today I'm going to be wiped out because I actually had to do some work today. Although it's not much work sitting here talking with all of you. But uh, we'll, we'll be back with that soon enough. Still... I did not expect it to take this long to have a full recovery. I mean, I feel fine. I feel great. And I got the all clear last week, had my final scan. They just had me go in and do a, a scan of my upper chest because that was the only part that didn't show up on any of the other MRIs that they had done. So they had me do that. And that came back as having, you know, no signs of anything. So I'm completely in the clear. I do have a week after next, I have a, an ultrasound for my kidneys. So, and then I'll, I'll go in every six months, I'll have scans. Every six months for the next five years to make sure that I remain cancer free. But I did not have any signs of this at all. I had no idea that I had a mass in my kidney. Never had blood in my urine or any of the other signs that you would get with it. What happened was I, back in September, Labor Day weekend, and a couple of days leading up to Labor Day weekend, I was in severe pain from a kidney stone. I didn't know it was a kidney stone. I thought it was sciatica. I was treating it as such. And finally, I got to the point, I'd gone to a wedding in Connecticut where I had to drive two hours, went to the wedding, came back, drove home two hours, went to go to bed and was just in such terrible pain that I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go to the hospital. Like, I, I've got to do something about this now. So it was like 4 a.m., 5 a.m. on a Sunday. Went to the hospital and they admitted me with a kidney stone. They, they had me undergo surgery to have my kidney stone removed. So they did that. Fine. I was out of the hospital, I think, the next day, the day after. And took a couple of days at home to recover, mainly because I had a, a catheter in and I wasn't going to come to work with that. Once that was removed, came back to work, everything was fine. But they had discovered in scanning my kidneys that I had a mass. And they said, we're just going to keep an eye on this. We're going to have you come back for an MRI in a couple of months and, you know, we'll keep an eye on it. And when they did the MRI, they said, this is concerning. We'll know for sure if it's cancer when we take it out. And then once they took it out, they biopsied it and it turns out, yes, it, it was cancer. So... That's kind of my little health journey and why you haven't heard me on Saturday nights for a little while. 508-996-0500. Good morning. You're next on WBSM. Hello? Hello. You're on the air. Hey, Tim. I didn't know you went through cancer. Um, I know we don't politically see eye to eye, but we do have that in common. I had prostate cancer four years ago. Oh, no. How, how are you doing now? I'm fine. I'm undetectable. I was in the hospital for two days. My 
what is it? A, I forget the letters all the time for the num the number they give you. The P C P S A number is that what it is? Um, yeah, your, your not sure. levels. Well, my number, the highest number that you can get is a ten, ten point oh. Mine mm-hmm. was a nine point seven three. Oof. And they they were treating me like I was all done. But I went right to Boston. I didn't stick around here. And uh, it was right in the middle of the lockdown. And they were doing just a few surgeries a week. I had to fight to get my surgery, but I got it removed. I was only in the hospital for two days. I never had any chemo. I never had any hormone treatment. I was home in two days and driving. Wow. They said I would, they said I would have to wear a diaper maybe for a year. I never wore a diaper. I bought a pack. They're still sitting in my closet. It's been four years. <laughs> well, you might need them in another 30 years or so. Well, I don't know. I don't know if this world's going to still be here in 30 years. And I probably won't. I'm 58, so. Well, I know I know. with mine, you know, in, in my particular case, first of all, everything just happened so fast. But um, I know that I was fortunate because I had it in my kidney and we have one of the best kidney surgeons on in, in Massachusetts right here uh, in New Bedford with South Coast Health, uh, Dr. LaRock. So he's the one that performed my surgery. So I never even had to get to the point where I had to go anywhere else. They did everything right here locally in, in Fairhaven and New Bedford and Fall River. So I was fortunate in that regard. But I people say, oh, you beat cancer. Congratulations. I say, no, no, no. I, I had it easy when it comes to cancer. I'm not one of these people that had to go through the chemo and, and all of those, you know, horrible situations. They just, I just lost an organ and that was it. You know, it was, it was Same here. relative Same with me. I mean, I, I know it sounds weird to say, but you know, thank God that's all we had to go through compared to what other people have to endure. Unbelievable. It, I mean, they were calling me a walking miracle. They didn't, they couldn't understand it. Yeah, it sounds they didn't like have it. a good prognosis for me. And um I can only thank Jesus for that. And uh as far as uh going to Boston, as soon as they told me, I I called in the parking lot and <laughs> called Boston <laughs> as soon as I found out and got the ball rolling. I found out in early February that I had it. I had it removed on May fifteenth. So May fifteenth will take four years. Well, I'm glad everything's working out well for you now. Me as well, but I understand about the tiredness. It's a, your body goes through a lot. Yeah, I mean, fighting that off. Some people have told me that it was, you know, it's the um, the anesthesia more than anything is what 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 made that last. But I, I can't imagine the anesthesia is still affecting me this late. It, no, it has to be more than that. No. I've been under about a dozen times. I've had numerous knee surgeries, ankle, hip gallbladder, you know, um, and I've been under anesthesia a lot of times and it never kept me tired years later. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's been four years and I still get tired easy. At the end of the day, I'm, I don't feel like doing anything. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully it stays away for you and hopefully we're, we're going to be healthy and we're going to live a long time. Well, they say once you hit five years, you're pretty much out of the woods. So I'm already figuring I'm pretty much close to out of the woods. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. No problem, and good luck. Thank you so much. That. Have a good weekend. You're welcome. You too. And I do want to uh, play that little interview for you that I did. Again, you know, totally different topic, but if you want to call in and discuss if you've gone through something similar and you want to share, absolutely, 508-996-0500. As I was, you know, going through it all, it, it, I I had that that feeling of immediately of I don't want to tell anybody about this, especially where the doctors were telling me right from the beginning. It, and again, I'm going to put this in very simple terms. It's obviously not this simple and not this cut and dry, but they were basically telling me like, don't worry, this is a very easy procedure. This is we're just going to take out. Originally, they were just going to take out the, the, the mass itself. They were just going to take out the cancer and leave the rest of my left kidney. It was only stage one, so they figured they could stage 1A, so they figured they could just take out the, the mass, and then I could have the rest of my kidney, and I'd have like a kidney and a half for the rest of my life, and I'd be okay. What ended up happening is, and I knew this was a possibility, they said when we get in there, it may not be something we can just take out just that. And I said, do you just got to do what you got to do? I trust you. You're the doctor. You know, you do what you got to do. 
And I, so I knew I might wake up with part of my kidney gone. I knew I might wake up with my whole kidney gone. And when they went in there, they originally had the robot doing the surgery. They went in, they realized it was too, too big. It had grown to stage one B by that point. So they ended up going in and taking out the whole kidney. So that was it. That effectively cured me. And so, again, it was, you know, kind of easy. So I said, you know, if I'm going to go through this and it's going to be that simple, I'm not going to get chemo and radiation. I'm not going to lose my hair. I'm not going to be sick. I'm not going to have all these side effects. So do I need to tell anybody? I can just keep it to myself because I don't want anybody feeling sorry for me because it's not anything to feel sorry about. Uh, I, I don't feel anything. I wouldn't have known I had it if it wasn't for the kidney stone. I was more concerned about whether or not I was going to get more kidney stones than anything else. So I was, you know, because that hurt. But I was generally, you know, positive outlook about everything that was going on and said, there's, there's no reason to really share this. But then I decided, hey, I have a platform here being on the radio and I can share this and spread awareness for something that I didn't know anything about, kidney cancer. And maybe I can help other people that are in a similar situation. So I decided to, and I, I went back and forth. I talked to friends and family about it. Like, uh, should I, should I say anything? Should I put something out there? I don't want people to feel sorry for me, but I also want people to not bother me either when I'm home recovering, you know, like, so what, what do I do here? And certainly not being on the radio for two or three weeks. If I didn't give an answer as to what was going on, people start to speculate. Like, is he coming back? Does he have COVID? Did, did something happen? Is, you know, and let's face it, I'm not, you know, until I started this weight loss journey, I was never the most healthy guy. So I could have a lot of things that go wrong with me and people would speculate. So I said, I'm just going to be open and honest about it. Hopefully it helps some people. And not only did I talk about it and share it with the audience, I had Dr. LaRock come on during Kidney Cancer Awareness Month in March to talk about it and it opened up a lot of people's eyes. So I hope that that, is something that at least helped one person. 508-996-0500. You know what? I'm going to take a break right here. We'll be back in a few moments. Welcome back in 508-996-0500. Uh, Answered 7 says, my wife had rectal cancer. She did chemo and radiation, then surgery to remove the tumor and bag. And then a few months later, this past February, she did the reversal and now is cancer free. Congratulations. The chemo and radiation alone killed the cancer. She had stage 3B. Wow. She feels great and felt great during all of this rough time. It was a long 2023, but 2024 so far has been great. This was the work of God that healed her. I'm glad you're doing well too, Tim. Thank you. And to everyone who has kicked cancer's ass, great job. Yeah, it's it's such a it's such a much more difficult route for others than what I went through. That's why if you hear, you know, the words kidney cancer, and there are different types of kidney cancers. We talked about that with Dr. LaRock, but if you hear those words, 
You don't have to be scared. It's, I mean, was it tough going through having a, an actual organ removed? Yes, but it wasn't, it wasn't the end of the world. But God, having to, to get up and move around that first time, uh, that was hard. That part was rough. But other than that, I mean, I, it was very, I was very lucky that I, they caught it as early as they did, that I didn't have to be at the point where I was, you know, actually sick and symptomatic. So I always just say, thank God for that kidney stone. If it wasn't for that, they never would have found it this early. The kidney stone was brutal, though. That part was really bad. Even worse than that was, well, I won't get into all the details because it's, it's a little gross. But having to urinate after that was the worst. That was the most pain that I endured out of everything that I went through, I think. You know, they ask you, like, Where, where's your pain from 1 to 10? I think that was the only time I got, you know, into the 8, 9, 10 range. Even having the, the kidney removed, I was like, nah, 6, 7. I have a high tolerance for pain, but the, the stone was brutal. And that, that was, it was already gone. It was just trying to go after that. And then when they finally did calf me, I looked at the nurse and I was like, you're, you're an angel from heaven. I've never felt this much relief in my life. Anyway, 508-996-0500. I mentioned that interview I did with Dr. Sabina Stanley earlier this week about what's hidden inside planets. I want to play that for you because I thought it was interesting and it's kind of fun. And I think it's a good thing for 420. If you're, uh, if you're partaking in that right now, it'll expand your mind. So if you're not partaking in it right now, well, maybe you want to if that's something that you do. Um, because this, this is a pretty interesting discussion. So I want to play that for you right now. Sabina Stanley, Ph.D., is a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Planetary Physics at Johns Hopkins University and scientist at the Applied Physics Laboratory focusing on magnetic fields and other geophysical elements as a means of studying planetary interiors, moons, asteroids, and exoplanets. She leads the Magnetism and Planetary Interiors Research Group at Johns Hopkins. She is a 2011 Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellow and received the William Gilbert Award of the American Geophysical Union in 2010. She was a participating scientist on the recent NASA Mars InSight mission, investigating the planet's ancient magnetic field. Her work has been featured on CBS, NBC, Fox, and NPR, and in the National Geographic magazine, Bloomberg View, and the Washington Post. She will be featured in the summer 2024 BBC series, The Planets 2, and is the creator of the Great Courses Lecture Series, A Field Guide to the Planets. And she joins us now. So, Sabina, first of all, my question is, you know, what, what exactly is planetary physics? How does that differ from, from the physics that we would generally know? What a great question. So I think of physics as uh, a tool. It, it's a way of looking at problems, right? Using fundamental equations that govern how nature behaves. And so you could apply physics to a bunch of different areas. And I happen to apply it to planets. You could apply it to humans or something and call it like maybe biological physics. You could apply it to outer space, astrophysics, but I apply it to planets. And so that's what planetary physics is. And so with that in mind, there, you know, when you look at the way that our universe is constructed, you, people always say, well, you know, everything had to kind of come together for life to exist on this planet the way that it does. Is it really, is it really that specific? Is it really that, um, is, is it really that much of a one in a billion shot that this is the planet that we were able to inhabit? So here's the challenging answer. We don't know. And what I mean by that is that here on earth, we have a sense of what environmental conditions were actually quite important to have life start on earth, right? It's really important to have uh, liquid water on the surface of the planet in contact with rocks, so our temperatures in the kind of good range. Uh, it's important to have the ingredients of complex chemistry, so things like um, uh, uh, large carbon molecules, things like that are really important because they can then kind of work in the water to build bigger and bigger molecules, eventually forming amino acids and life. It's important to have an energy source. You got to feed all these these chemical reactions and stuff. We have solar energy coming from the sun. So those seem to be what we think are the ingredients for life. 
Uh, and so if you look at other planets and you start asking, well, which of them have it? Uh, some of them seem to have the right ingredients for life. And so maybe those are good candidates to look to look for life. Uh, but we're also finding that where, where we thought we wouldn't expect those ingredients, the liquid water, the energy sources, the complex molecules, we're finding more of that out there than we thought. Um, you just have to kind of look in careful places. So I'll give you an example. Go to the outer solar system. It's freezing out there, right? You wouldn't expect the frozen surfaces of like some of the icy moons in the outer solar system, like Europa or, or Titan, uh, to be habitable because there isn't liquid water on the surface. But you go down um, some 10 kilometers or so, and you get a liquid water ocean down there, and it's kind of protected, and it has all the ingredients. So maybe there's life down there. So I think we really need to explore all the places we think we might have the right conditions for life in our solar system and, and see what we learn from it. And, and the name of your book is called What's Hidden Inside Planets. And really, it's that inside stuff that might be the stuff that makes up what we're looking for here. And we're only at the cusp of being able to really know what's inside other planets besides our own. Absolutely. So here's the amazing thing, right? We love the surface of the Earth. There's tons of reasons that it's a great place to live. But the surface of the Earth would not be that way if it weren't for the processes happening below our feet. If it weren't for the recycling of the surface through plate tectonics that creates things like volcanoes, degassing uh, uh, volatiles like water vapor into the air, we wouldn't have oceans, right? And so we need to understand the processes happening deep inside the planet in order to understand why the surface of a planet is what it is. And I think we look at the way our planet is constructed and the way that species have evolved in our planet and expect that it would be the same from one to the next. Uh, but again, it's a confluence of a lot of things that have made us who we are and, and made our world what it is. But when you are looking and seeing that there might be these other possibilities, you're taking what we know about Earth and applying it to these other planets. Are we able to take things that you're seeing on other planets and applying that to what we know about Earth? Wow, I love that question so much. I think we do that a lot when it comes to, um, for example, processes, like the fact that when we look at Mars and the moon and Mercury, the craters that we see on those planets tell us about how much planets have been impacted by, by meteors in the past. Uh, and that actually is really important information to get from those bodies, Mars, Mercury, and the moon, because the Earth's surface is so young because we have plate tectonics, we don't actually get to see the very far past. So we actually use our, our, our planetary neighbors to learn about our own early history um, by looking at theirs because their surfaces are so old. Um, but also when we look, I think it's really when we started noticing, hey, there's a lot of um, stuff happening in the outer solar system on these icy moons uh, that might make them habitable locations as we, if we look deep down. Then we started to look for life maybe in places we weren't expecting it here on Earth either, right? And now you can find life pretty much anywhere you look here, right? You, you go to... Um, the, the, the Antarctic, you go to the Arctic, you find new types of life frozen in ice, you find uh, life at the bottom of oceans near hydrothermal vents, um, which would, you know, we, we wouldn't have thought of those as hospitable environments. And maybe those are similar to wh what's happening at the bottoms of the oceans in Europa. Well, but part of it, too, means that we find it or we find the possibilities for it how can we kind of extrapolate that out then to know if you know could it could we go to these planets could we go to these moons how do we gather enough data and enough information to know that that's possible granted of course we'd have to be able to get there and that's a whole different uh issue but how do we know that we could land a person on one of these planets or moons and they would be able to survive yeah, yeah, great question. So first of all, there's the question of how do we how do we notice life? Let's put it that way, especially if you're far away and looking at things through telescopes. And there what we're looking for are what we call biosignatures, signatures that life is doing something to change the, the chemical makeup of the atmosphere or the surface. Uh, and that's really what we're doing for exoplanets, so planets around other stars, because we can't get anything except um, just tiny specks of light from, from those uh, planets through telescopes. Uh, we look for what molecules are there that we would expect to be there because life has created them, right? And and what ratio of molecules, how much methane do you have in an atmosphere versus carbon dioxide versus oxygen, right? So these are the kinds of things that people are, are working on. It's really challenging because there are lots of different ways to create certain molecules and we don't want to be um, uh, attributing something to life when it isn't life, right? So that's what scientists are working on now is really trying to understand uh, when you get a picture of an atmosphere in terms of what all the chemical makeup of it is, how much of that chemical in the atmosphere is due to life? 
With Well, with that in mind, is there a place that you have found that you would want to go to, that you would want to travel, that you would want to see firsthand? Oh, so many places. As long as they fix the whole gravity thing in space and like good food and something, then I'd be willing to travel there or or maybe just, uh, you know. Not a fan of tang, I take it then. Yeah, not, not a fan of the transport. But if you can teleport me there, I think I would really like to um, go to Titan, which is a moon of Saturn. Now, Titan's really interesting because... Um, not only is it one of the only other bodies out there that has a nitrogen-based atmosphere like the Earth, but uh, the atmosphere is kind of thick like the Earth. So the pressure on the surface of Titan is similar to Earth's pressure, but gravity on Titan is really low because it's a really small moon. And so that means with a thick atmosphere and really low gravity, it's really easy to fly on Titan. So if I were to go to Titan, I would strap some cardboard to my arms, flap them, and I'd be flying on Titan. And I think that would be a really cool experience. I think that's a great idea. I'd be right there with you. Uh, so you write about in your book about, um, you know, a lot of the correlations between what it is that you do and also art. What are, what are some of the tie-ins and the correlations between those? Yeah, I love thinking about how similar the processes are for how scientists do their work and how artists do, our, do their work, right? Um, you start, you have, you have a vision for something, you have an idea, um, you have to be very technical and think about what your tools are to, to deliver that idea into reality, to, to create it, right? Um, you get really lost in your work, you can spend lots of time hyper-focusing on it for a really long time, and in the end, you've created something new that, that others didn't know about in the past, you've brought something to the world. So I think the process of the scientist and the artist are very similar, and I absolutely I love that. But I also think that art is an incredible way um, for people to connect to science. If we could do more, sci bring science to um, through art to the world more, we'd have a better understanding and appreciation of the science that, pe that we do that's so important uh, for society uh, through the art that it would uh, be represented in. And, and really, you've got to be thinking like an artist when you are looking into some of these these uh, exoplanets and you've got to kind of envision these things in your mind to be able to actually get an understanding of what it is that we're finding out scientifically it's it's one thing to say we know these facts it's another thing to start to be able to imagine uh what it would actually be like to be on those planets yeah absolutely i love this there's a quote by um vladimir nabokov who says uh somewhere in the quote he says talks about the the passion of the scientist and the precision of the artist, right? And it's kind of a, a, a different way of describing because you would normally think of the scientist as being precise and the artist as being passionate. But in reality, it, it's both of those. And, and it's really interesting to juxtapose them. There's, there's a feeling that a lot of people have that when somebody writes a book like What's Hidden Inside Planets, that the person who wrote the book uh, is an expert that has all the answers and that knows everything and just sits down and takes all of their knowledge and puts it on the page. But anybody who's ever sat down and written a book knows it's a journey. It's a journey of learning things. What are some of the things that you learned about in putting this book together and some things that were really kind of eye opening for you? Oh, you're absolutely right. It's such a journey. And I think one of the fun stories that I learned about by, by writing the book has to do with what I'm going to call the mantle race. So everyone's sort of familiar with the space race that happened in the, the middle of the 1900s with uh, different superpowers in the, in the Earth trying to get to the moon first. And very few people know about the mantle race and that the similar superpowers, the U.S., the former Soviet Union, they're also trying to get to the, a layer of the earth below the crust called the mantle. And that meant drilling into the earth um, tens to hundreds of kilometers. And that's incredibly hard to do because as you go deeper inside the earth, temperatures are rising to thousands of degrees, pressures are increasing, eventually hitting like millions of atmospheric pressures. Uh, and so... Countries were trying to do that, and they were trying to outcompete each other. Um, but it ended up kind of being, you know, maybe this isn't a fair way to put it. It was a bit of a disaster, right? Because the way people, first of all, it was a really hard thing to do. Um, but secondly, it just was really not managed very well, especially the, the U.S. effort on that. So it was really interesting to read and, and learn about the story behind the mantle race. Well, you know, if we go back to Victorian science fiction, they were writing about people living inside the Earth and follow that all the way up to today with these new Godzilla and, and King Kong Monsterverse movies. And they're talking about, you know, the idea of there being a world below the surface of our world. Do you think that there's any possibility of that? Is there is there anything inside? And I don't mean, you know, a whole world with King Kong and Godzilla living in it. But is it possible that there could be signs of life inside the Earth that, that we don't know about? 
Uh, wow. Great question. So there is to some extent, right? Uh, so when people dig or drill, for example, or go down in mines to about a, a kilometer or two in depth, you actually find life in, in the rocks and water deposits down there. So we do know that there is an entire ecosystem below the surface of the earth. But I don't think if you go much further down than that, then the environment is really um, in any way hospitable to life. But there's definitely stuff we're just learning about the life a kilometer below our feet, let alone, say, 2,000 kilometers below our feet. So there's no need for me to worry right now about Godzilla or Kong? No, but if I'm remembering correctly from uh, those movies, there, there's sort of like this alternate universe and stuff or portals that they go through. So I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't worry about it because maybe that's happening. It is. Uh, <laughs> listen, you just made it harder for me to sleep tonight. Uh, the, one of the few nightmares I've ever had in my life is a recurring dream about Godzilla outside my house. Okay. But anyway, the name of the book is What's Hidden Inside Planets. You can pick it up now uh, online at Amazon or wherever you get your books from. I want to thank you, Sabina, for joining us. This has been a fascinating discussion and it's a fascinating book. Thanks so much. I had a lot of fun. Thank you. All right. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, that was a very fun conversation I had with Dr. Sabina Stanley. And, you know, sometimes it's good to just ponder things off our planet. Ponder things that are out there in the vastness of space. Especially today, 420, if that's your thing. Uh, one thing I want to make you aware of is, as you know, WPRI, Channel 12, they have their weekly newsmakers program which I believe airs on Sundays, but it's available as a podcast. They, re they, f they record it on Fridays, and they'll usually put out video clips from it over the weekend, and they'll put the podcast out on Friday. And this week they have New Bedford Mayor John Mitchell in, and they have an article up. You can listen to the podcast if you'd like to um, on the Channel 12 website or wherever you get your podcasts from, but they also have a story up on WPRI.com where Mayor Mitchell said that he expects to have South Coast Rail operational by the fall. So if you re remember, uh, last week there was a meeting on South Coast Rail in Fall River where Gene Fox said that it's not going to be by mid-July as they thought. That there's been another delay as they are trying to test out all the tracks and uh, train crews and basically inform the public about track safety that this is kind of pushing things back a little bit, so it's looking like it'll be not midsummer as predicted. When that is, they haven't really announced the timeline, but Mayor Mitchell saying he's expecting it to happen by the fall, but as he tells newsmakers, my understanding is the fall, whenever that is, I don't know if that means Labor Day or if it means or when the leaves start to turn. So it's not gonna happen this summer. It is looking like it'll likely be the fall. And Mayor Mitchell said, the explanation is they have to work out the kinks, which is to say they have constructed just about everything that needs to be constructed. What I would say is they have to pick a date, though, and publicly announce it. Projects move ahead when there are deadlines. And that's, that's the concerning part about this, is now they're saying that they're not putting any timeline on this. Well, what does that mean? Because nothing's going to... People were already frustrated enough with how long it took this to even come to fruition. There are still people who believe it's not going to happen. But now people see there are stations that have been constructed. The pedestrian bridge is in the process of being constructed. I mean, the good news now is the pedestrian bridge will definitely be finished in time. But people are seeing all of this happen now. And anticipation is building, yet now they're saying, oh, there's another delay. And this delay is a little bit less concrete in terms of, A, why it's happening, and B, when we can expect a new date to be set. So listen, I, I still think it's an important thing. I still think it should happen. For number one reason more than anything, we already pay for rail service in the rest of the Commonwealth. It's our tax dollars that go to building these commuter rails in north of Boston and Metro West and all of those other places. So why don't we get one too? Two, I do think it'll be something people utilize. Not just for commuting back and forth to Boston, but for families that want to get to Boston on the weekend. People that want to go into Boston for, I'm going to do it. 
There'll be times that I'm sure I'll take it into Boston. I don't like not having my car. But certainly if I'm going to go to a concert or something, or maybe I'm going to go to Fenway Park or something, eh, let's do it. Let's take it. Try it out. I might go and take it just for the sake of the ride. In fact, when it finally does launch, I'll probably leave the station after the show, go down to the Whale's Tooth parking lot or Church Street, jump on the next train into Boston, take that ride, then take a ride back from Boston back to New Bedford. Why? Uh, well, I love trains, but also I want to take that route so I can talk to you about it. But it is happening. It is coming. Your thoughts on that? 508-996-0500. Or you can use App Chat on the WBSM app. I also mentioned a story. This was something that we got some calls and, and App Chat messages about on my program earlier this week. But there's a local cleaning company. And I won't, I won't say the name because I don't want to... They put these people on blast, but I don't want to put those people on blast through this cleaning company and cause any problems. But basically, this cleaning company showed up at a home this week, one of their regular clients, to clean their home. When they arrived, when this woman arrived, the family, with the entire family was home, which she was like, okay, that happens. I mean, it's school vacation week and all that stuff, so it's not that uncommon. And she proceeds to clean the house top to bottom. And when she's done, she goes to collect payment from the client. And the client hands her the money and says, oh, and, and by the way, we've all been homesick this week with COVID. So they waited until after she had been in the house for a couple of hours, clean, cleaned the whole house, and then told her we have COVID. Now, whether or not they were still symptomatic or, or, or contagious, rather, at that point is beside the point. Having even COVID is beside the point. It's kind of any kind of illness that's communicable, communicable transmittable. And then waiting until after she was done to tell her that they had it. So then she went and called her, you know, other clients that she had to service and let them know. And of course, most of them said, please don't come to my house. So she lost money as a result of this. She put her own health at risk. She put the health of family members at risk because these people were so selfish that they had to get their house cleaned. That they couldn't have said to her at the beginning, hey, just so you know, we're all sick in case you don't want to stay. Or they could have called her and said, hey, maybe we should move this. We're all sick. I get it. You're sick. You're homesick. Everybody's homesick. You're probably not thinking to yourself, oh, I should call the cleaning company and tell them not to come. You've got other things that you're worried about. But when she showed up at your door, the answer shouldn't have been, well, come on in. It should have been, hold on. I, f I should have called you and I forgot. We've all been sick. It's up to you if you want to stay or not. But this just sounds like it was just utter selfishness if they wanted to make sure that they got their place cleaned. And it's inconsiderate. And again, I, this isn't a COVID thing. I know people are going to call in and argue, well, you know, COVID's not any worse than the, than the flu. I know, it's, but it's not, this isn't a COVID thing. It just so happened that these people had COVID. The point is that they were sick. They were sick and that she could have gotten sick from them. And she could have made others, other people sick from them. And she didn't, they, they didn't bother to tell her. So it's not a COVID thing per se. It could have been the flu. It could have been strep throat. It could have been a stomach bug. But it's just selfishness that they didn't say something ahead of time. Because they want to make sure that their house got cleaned. 508-996-0500. I'm going to uh, I'm going to take a break here, but you can uh, call in with your thoughts or send app chat messages on the WBSM app. We'll be right back. Sam.
Nothing wrong with a little Slade to wrap up the program. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. While well, I was filling in for Ken, he'll be back with you next week. But, um, and generally, you know, I try not to stick you with having to hear me again, but all of our fill-in help was otherwise busy today as well. So happy to step in where needed. Uh, and hopefully you tune in weekday mornings from 6 to 9 when I'm normally here with you. And check out my articles at WBSM.com and on the WBSM app. Had a lot of interesting things this week and last week to read about. So you can check those articles out and see what you think about those. We were talking about that cleaning company where they showed up and after the woman cleaned the house, then the family told them, oh, by the way, we all have COVID. Answered seven in a cushion and sent in an app chat message saying, if anything, those people before stepping foot inside the house should have been wearing a mask. And tell the owners, the owners tell them they were sick. And if they still want them to clean, then they should wear a mask. And I don't know if she wears one anyway. I mean, she might because of, you know, the chemicals and stuff that she works with. Uh, but it's just selfishness. That's what it was. It was, I want to make sure that I get my house cleaned. And I don't want her to leave if she finds out that we're sick. So we'll, we'll tell her because we have to tell her. But we'll tell her afterwards. And I mean, I guess at least they told her so that she didn't go to another client. Because, you know, who hires cleaning services? People who can't clean their homes themselves. People who might be older or might have some sort of debilitation or maybe families that have small kids that don't have time to clean. Because the parents are each working two jobs and, and trying to make ends meet. So there's a lot of people that she comes in contact with. And she even said that. I come in in contact with a lot of people who are young. A lot of people who are elderly. A lot of people who are pregnant. Pregnant women have trouble cleaning. They hire her to come in and take care of it. While, while they're to the point where it's a little bit too much for them to handle. So again, just selfishness. That's what it all comes down to. And it's disgusting. So I, I feel bad for this person that she went through that situation and for the money that she lost. And somebody during the week when we talked about this suggested that she might want to look into taking some legal action against them. I don't know if it's going to get to that point, but she did fire them as a client. She did say, uh, I am no longer your cleaning service. I, I don't feel comfortable cleaning your home anymore. So good for her. That's going to do it for me for today. I'll be back on Monday morning if you want to Tune in and hang out with me then. On Mondays, we always have Jack Spillane of New Bedford Light to talk about all of the things going on in and around the city. So we'll do that this Monday. Uh, I hope that you all have a great day despite the rain. I hope that you have a fantastic weekend. And as I like to say on my show, I hope that you enjoy every sandwich. WBSM and W258DR, New Bedford, a Town Square media station.